Hi, everybody. Welcome to a very, very special evening. I've wanted to do this for a little while, but thank God I have been extremely busy with matchmaking, with weddings, lots of weddings this summer. Thank God of people who we've matched up. So um, I'm really happy to have this kind of evening to set aside for you. The goal of tonight is for you to just relax and you can either listen to my answers to other people's questions, or you yourself can ask questions. Uh, you can direct message them to me privately, or you can message them to me publicly. It really doesn't matter. So many of you, many of you asked in advance. What's fascinating to me about the fact that you asked in advance, that many of you asked the same questions in advance. That's interesting to me. Before we get started, i like to thank everyone who donated tonight. The money that we collected from the donations tonight is going to help needy brides get married. It's a special fund that I have to help those who are in need. It is a special omen, a segula, to support a bride in need. And in return, Hashem will support you in your journey. So if you ever hear of a couple in need, give them money, give them physical support. If you don't have money, you can also help them, help them plan their wedding. These are really important things that you can do that would allow you to be able to have a spiritual merit, not only a physical merit, but also a spiritual merit. Now, there's a lot of singles here tonight. And I always say that anytime there's a room full of singles, you never know. The magic is in the air. So what I want you to do, if you would like, you have two options tonight. You can put an NA in front of your name, which means not available, don't message me, don't contact me. Or you can put um, an A in front of your name and you can say uh, your age range, your city, your religious orientation, political orientation, whatever is important to you for you to be able to put, just change your name, your name in the Zoom to whatever you think is important for someone to know about you. I always say specific is terrific. That means that if you want to put something specific there, I think that is something that will help you uh, long term. So you never know. There could be someone here tonight and you and having side conversations while I'm talking is not a bad thing either. If you don't have a J Montreal, J Toronto or J matchmaking profile, please make one. You can use marketing code Rabbi's Gift. It's my my gift, you get your first month for free. Since the uh, Jewish matchmaking came out, a lot of people don't know this, but there has been. jmatchmaking.com is the primary place that people from the show go to uh, to find someone. There have been thousands, thousands and thousands of people who have signed up. Probably some people even here who are listening came via the show. And so... These are people who have signed up in the past 70 days, which means that it's very a very good system right now. It's debatable, the largest Jewish online database. It is matchmaker-based. It is private. It's not public browsing. But I do encourage you, if you don't have, or a friend of yours doesn't have a J Matchmaking or one of our sites, something having to do with J Matchmaking profile, please make one. It's, um, it's imperative. Again, throughout the class, you are welcome to private message me your questions, and I will try to get to every single question. And with that, uh, tonight, has I have not planned anything. Not only have I not planned anything, I have not looked at any of these questions. So without any uh, further uh, introduction, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rabbi Yisrael Bernath for the past almost 20 years, I have been matchmaking, talking, educating, discussing. I have listened to the wanes and woes of thousands of singles. And I can tell you, there are some people who say that matchmaking is the hardest job in the world. I don't agree with that. I think dating is the hardest job in the world. The hardest thing to do in the entire world is to date. It takes vulnerability. It's challenging. It's putting yourself out there. 
it's getting rejected over and over and over again. But what I tell you is you are looking for a grand slam. And being that you're looking for a grand slam, it could be, it could be that you're going to have to strike out a bunch of times. But every single time you get rejected, it's one step closer to finding your person. And the same way for many of you in your life at some point, you had to focus primarily on your career in order to be able to move and have the success in your career that you have. For many people, the, the time has come right now to focus on your dating life, on your personal life. You have to see it the same way. I don't think you should see it as a career, but see it the same way. See that your dating life is so important. Your relationship life is so important. Now, part of the problem is, problem is, part of the, the challenge is that a lot of the things that we need to be good daters are actually the opposite of the things that we need to be good relationshipers, people that are in marriages, people that are in long-term marriages. And so I want you to think about that, that maybe my, my, my principle to start off this evening with is if dating is supposed to lead to marriage, then dating should be like marriage. If dating is supposed to lead to marriage, then dating should be like marriage. With that, I'm going to go into some of the questions. The first question that I got tonight, um, and I'm going to ask it the way that it was asked. If you're in a relationship and someone wants to take a phone break, what does it mean and how can you handle it? It is different if the relationship is long distance. So I'm assuming that this person is referring to a long distance relationship because why would someone have uh, a phone break if they why would be talking on the phone if you're in person you should be in person so when someone suggests a phone break it generally means that they're seeking some kind of space they're seeking time for self-reflection they're seeking the ability to recharge without the the constant focus and, and in your face of the relationship. Relationships can become heavy. And that's without the added pressure of other things. So I think that how to handle it is to communicate. I don't know why it seems to be that dating has become a game. I don't think dating is a game. It's real life. And why can't we just approach it with an understanding that this is real? And right now I need a break. I don't, not that I don't like you, not that you're not for me. Maybe you are for me, but right now I need time and space to be able to analyze, to be able to understand. And if you can discuss that with your date openly and you can understand the reasons for that break, whatever that break is, and you can set boundaries. Boundaries are fantastic in relationships. And don't worry about it. If the, it's not like you're going to say you have nothing to lose. And I think it's a good way to approach dating, but there's nothing to lose. If it happens to be that the person doesn't agree with you on the boundary, then it's not a person for you. That's okay. But if you need that and you listen to yourself and your inner voice and you need that, I think that's a very, very important thing. Now, with long distance relationships, long distance relationships are inherently challenging. Thank God we live in a world of technology and we're able to connect in a different way. Now, if you have a trouble connecting over technology, that's an important thing. Then probably long distance relationships are not good for you. If you don't have a problem or somebody was saying before that they're willing to move anywhere, then I think that long distance relationships could be good. But you need to know that it's not going to be the same as being in person and when you do end up in person, they're going. it's going to be much more intense, much more intense than a regular relationship. And so you have to just be careful 
an understanding of that, that that's just the reality of your relationship. It's not bad or good. It's just the reality. The reality is that you're going to have this time where you're going to be talking and it's going to be built up. The, the, the emotional tension will be built up. And if you get together, it's going to be very intense. And that's just the reality of your relationship. Uh, next question. I've had difficult, unsuccessful relationships in the past. Choices were made based on looks, religion, and career. Not kindness or relationship skills, which I assumed were there. Okay. How does one shift or switch to look at and see the right qualities up front and still have some or all the nice superficial qualities that make life fun? I love this question. I love this question. So you're asking a couple of different questions here. I will try to address all of them. I think it's important for you to know that we are nuanced, multifaceted creatures. And external qualities and looks are important. Shared religious belief or professional accomplishments, these are important. But a lasting relationship is going to be more than that. And I love the fact that you realize that. Now, you're trying to balance that, right, between what you call the superficial qualities and what you call the right qualities, which I don't know if that's true, because what you call the superficial qualities are also important. You need to be attractive. Now, it could be, I'm just saying this, and you may not like me saying this, but it could be the person that you're attracted to is not really because you have this warped version of attraction based on Hollywood or based on the fact that whatever I, you, you, you can, you can use your own imagination. I don't have to tell you why people have warped views of attraction. So make sure that it's real attraction, which means make sure that you're the complement of the person that you're looking for. Now, what do we do about the right quality? So you need to be attracted, but really attracted. I'm not talking about, uh, I don't, I don't like uh, using numbers for people. I think that's really disgusting that sometimes people use numbers. But you have to make sure that that it's a, it's a real, it's an authentic attraction. And then you have to talk about qualities. Qualities is a very a very difficult thing. Maybe maybe you should shift focus. Which means number 1, I want to say that I really appreciate this question that you're trying to balance this, what you call superficial with real qualities, because just that awareness, just the very fact that you're asking this question means that you're already recognizing that maybe the, the previous choices that you made didn't yield the, well, I mean, here you are, you're single. So obviously <laughs> the previous choices you made didn't work. I mean, at least for long-term. So just having that awareness is already an amazing way to shift focus. Now, external qualities are very easily noticeable. Intangibles, like kindness, like patience, like uh, uh, these qualities, so to speak, that some of us are looking for, or hopefully most of us are looking for, I think they require a, a more profound observation, a more profound interaction, the ability to engage in, in deeper conversations, to ask open-ended questions, not closed questions, to see how a person reacts in varied situations. That is what dating is supposed to be. Dating is supposed to be the ability to really connect with someone on that quality level. You're not going to be able every how I think the number one word I see on on dating profiles is kind and travel. Travel very popular. People want to travel. I'm very happy you want to travel. I, I would say those are the two my anecdotal research here, kind and travel. So maybe write down a list. Start thinking of qualities that are non-negotiable for you. Just a few of them. You can't have too many but a few non-negotiable qualities that you're looking for 
And the word kind doesn't mean anything to me. Specific is terrific. I want to know what kind means to you. If kind is important to you, then tell me, define it. It's not one word. It's a definition. And kind means very different things to very different people. I would say also, compromise, but don't settle. If, if you're looking for a value, it could be an ideal. But when you meet the person, it may not be exactly as you define the value. When you define that value, it's a theoretical idea. But then a person comes along and that person becomes practical. So I don't like the word settling down. People say, oh, I'm settling down. I'd rather the word compromise, which means I'm compromising between what I thought I was looking for and the person in front of me. Because at the end of the day, the person that you think you're looking for, it's only theoretical. Practically speaking, that's not the person you're looking for because it has to be a real person. So until you're able to have a real person in front of you, everything that you're writing there is theoretical. So I would say have a balance, write the value, but then remember that when the real person comes along, they may not be exactly as you thought that value would be. I hope that helps. Next question. What is the best advice for me to meet someone? I've been trying really hard, but nothing has happened. Hmm. Okay. I don't know what the definition of trying really hard. Does So I think that there is someone out there for you. Everyone has a soulmate. It's not that one, don't put so much pressure on it. Sometimes you put too much pressure on it. It's not that one, the one person. Everyone has a person. It could be lots of lots of people could fit the goal, but you just need one. Lots of people can fit your values, but you just need one. So I don't know what that means that you've been trying to put yourself out there and it's not working. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do to to put first of all physical just and this i know some of you and someone asked before we went live here about privacy i know some people like to be private or some people are more introverted it's much harder for you to get out in that case maybe you're not going to be going to as many events but not always is it events the right way to to, to meet someone you may need an intermediary. You may need a matchmaker or or somebody to, to help a friend. Friends are the best way. Go to your friend and say, you've dated a lot of people. Maybe you was a great guy or a great gal. And they weren't good for you, but they're good. And maybe they'll be good for me. Ask your friends to set you up. And I think that the best matchmakers are friends. It's sometimes really hard because you don't want to be the, the friend that's known for the person that it didn't work out. But I think we need to put ourselves out there. If you dated someone and they were good, but not good for you, think of someone you can set them up with. Think of a friend that you can set them up with. Sometimes you need a real matchmaker. Uh, there's a lot of great, I mean, you can use J Matchmaking. We have a lot of really great matchmakers on J Matchmaking. And I encourage you to use them. And it's becoming better and better every single day. Sometimes I think you need to broaden your horizons. It's possible that you're looking in the same places that you've always been looking and not finding success. So stepping out of your comfort zone, trying new activities, exploring different communities, get introduced to different groups of people. I think it's such an important thing. We some. Somehow we often, because it's comfortable, I understand, we stay siloed. And people will say, I'll go to a city, they'll say, I know everybody in this city. No, you don't. You know everybody in your circle of where you hang out. Go beyond that circle. Be creative. Find. Find other avenues. 
be authentic. Always be true to who you are. If you're genuine in heart and soul, you're going to create connections. You're going to be able to create connections that will form lasting bonds. Um, if the if the apps work for you, use the apps. Often I find that it's really difficult with the apps because not every one of those apps are looking for something long-term. So if you're looking for something that's serious and long-term, you may want to, some of the apps are good and sometimes it's not. So you have to be careful over there. Patience and trust. I can't stress this enough. If you run after it too much, it runs away from you. Love often comes when you least expect it. I'm not saying don't do your job. I'm not saying don't do the work. But somehow you, you meet this guy and he's like, oh my gosh, this could be the one. And there's so much pressure, so much pressure on this particular thing because this could be the one, this could be my soulmate. Relax, relax. You're dating to see if you're interested. You're dating to see if you're curious. If you see somebody and you're curious for more, date them again. And if you date them once and you're still curious, date them again. And if you date them twice and you're still curious, date them again. Don't, and other things, you don't go 20 steps ahead. Just relax. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But patience and trust. You need to know that, A, the timing in your life is right. And you have to believe that the right person will come along when the time is right. In Judaism, we believe that the right time is more important than the right person. I will say that again because I think it's so important. The right time is more important than the right person. Mystery in your history. Reflect on past relationships. Maybe there's somebody there in your past. There's a lot of studies that show that in your past, there could be someone that you've dated that maybe was the wrong timing then, but could be the right timing now. A lot of people, if you ask them about their long-term relationship, they'll say, oh, they met here, and then they met again here, and they met again here, and they met again here. Think about your past. Okay. I wasn't planning on spending so much time on each of these questions, but I guess the, I'm feeling that maybe some of these questions are really important to spend some time on. And so uh, for those of you who are just coming in, you should know the reason why you see uh, um, different people having their their city and age range and religious background is because if you're available, if you're not available, you can put an NA in front of your name. If you're available, you can put an A in front of your name and you never know. There could be somebody here for you or there could be somebody here who will get to know you, who has a friend for you. Think of yourself as the matchmaker. Not only you're looking for yourself, look for your friends. And I guarantee you, if you look for your friends, God will give you the gift of someone looking for you and God will look out for you. Question, the next question. Um, I'm divorced, yet I still believe in marriage and the blessing of Nachat, Hebrew for, I guess, pleasure or nachat. Uh, there is when God is with the two people who are happily married. My question is a spiritual one. What is the best way to meet the other part of my neshama? So just the background behind this, according to Judaism, that you and your soulmate are two halves of one soul. So this person is asking, based on the Jewish belief, that you are two halves of one soul. So where is the other part of my soul? And once we do meet, how do we make sure that we are really for each other? How do we know that it will be with the grace to be happily married? What is my role in having a good relationship with my future husband? And how may I assist in sustaining a good and happy marriage with this balanced lifestyle? There's a lot of questions here. And I think that I'm going to try to, I'm not going to be able to answer all of them. But the first thing I want to say is that this person is one of those people that I'm talking about that puts a lot of pressure. You're not looking for perfect. You're looking for 
perfect for me. And it's going to be a real person, not a thought, not a theoretical person. There are a lot of people who are married to people in their head. Yep. They may have dated someone a long time ago, and that person may have moved on, but you didn't. If you're one of those people, it's okay. But there's no space in your head for anyone else. There are other people who are married to an idea of a person in their head, which means they have a list and they're looking for a specific person. And I'm happy. And, and you will get that person, exactly the person you're looking for. But it's going to be that much harder because you, you have a very specific person that you're looking for. And that person right now is in your head and not in real life. But I, I think that it's really important to think about your journey and your hope and that your desire, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You don't have to worry. The other thing that I'm seeing hidden in this question is the fact that maybe the person asking this question doesn't know what a real relationship looks like. It could be the reason why this person doesn't know what a real relationship looks like is because their parents got divorced or maybe their parents didn't have a happy marriage or maybe they don't know what a happy marriage looks like. And because they don't know what a happy marriage looks like, they have a hard time knowing what it is if they're looking for it. And so what I would say to that is there are three things that you can do to be able to solve that problem. Number one is you, if your parents didn't have a happy, happy relationship or they got divorced, you um, need to find out why they got divorced or why it wasn't happy. Now, who do you ask? Yourself. You ask yourself. It doesn't matter why your parents got divorced or why they weren't happy. What matters is your narrative. Often your narrative is going to be a childlike narrative. It's important to ask that question to yourself and answer it yourself. The second thing is you have to say, it's not my fault. I have nothing to do with it. It's their relationship. It's not mine. And number three, I would say is the most important. And that is you have to find a couple that you can model your relationship after. It could be an aunt and uncle. It could be a, a brother or sister. It could be a, a, a friend, some other person, a real relationship and say, this is my ideal relationship. This is the person that that's the kind of relationship that I want to have. And then you can either observe them or ask them questions. You need to know in real life what a real relationship looks like. And 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 believe believe in marriage, believe in relationships again. I know it's really hard. I know I'm asking something that's really really hard, but but that's that's what it is. There's a lot of spiritual things that you can do to prepare. Uh, in the beginning of today's class, I spoke about um, giving to a needy bride, very important, or giving charity in general. Some people have a tradition of giving in denominations of 18 and specifically asking for their the other half of their soul, um, taking on a new mitzvah, taking on some kind of something and say, this is an honor of, of finding my person when we're finding a, our person, finding that person is, is probably going to be one of the most difficult things that you'll ever do in your life. And so therefore, the, a blessing of that nature needs a very big vessel, like water. If you put out your hands, you can only hold so much water in your hands, but you need a cup. Blessings need vessels. Vessels are mitzvahs. And sometimes you just need a, a vessel that's big enough to be able to handle your blessing. So if you say, I take on this particular mitzvah, whatever it is, uh, I'm going to take on, and everyone knows their own religious level, and I'm going to do it in honor of finding my person. And this is going to be the keli, this is going to be the vessel to be able to find that person. Next question. How do I know if the guy I've been dating a while 
I'm feeling emotionally distant from. How do I know if he's really warm and capable of being emotionally in tune? Being able to connect with me in an emotional way. How can I tell if someone will be warm, will be warm and emotionally present once you're married? It's not fair to ask a question about once a person's married. First of all, it's a very good question. I'm kind of analyzing the question, but I think it's important for you to see things in the present. There could be a million reasons why someone's distant. And 999,000 of them could have nothing to do with you. Maybe a million of them could have nothing to do with you. So I think it's important to open the conversation, to be direct. And I think that part of that being direct is actually opening a conversation and communication, which is one of the pivotal things that we need to sustain a long lasting relationship. So just start talking, say broadcast live, say the thing. Yeah, may, maybe maybe it'll be hard. Maybe the person won't be able to, to accept it, but opening up and, and being vulnerable and sharing your feelings, I know it's difficult. But if you feel emotionally distant, the only way to feel emotionally close is to be vulnerable. Now, if the person doesn't respond by being vulnerable, then you know that there's something more than you. And maybe perhaps this is not the person for you because, well, you want someone who's more emotionally available. And this person doesn't have the ability to be emotionally available. I think empathy is also important. When you share your feelings, think about does the person try to 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 be empath you know be empathetic, or does that person brush your feelings off? It could also mean that your relationship is is asking for closeness. It's asking for the next level. Maybe it's just asking for something more. But at the end of the day, I would say if there's something bothering you and you are the person who's emotionally available, you're probably intuitive as well. So trust your gut, trust your feeling, trust your feeling that's combined with your logical reasoning and it's gonna guide you. And you can also ask for advice specifically for someone who can give you advice. Okay. Um, next question. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna move from uh, some of the questions in advance. I have a bunch more that were asked in advance, but I'm going to move to some that are just asked because the the my uh, my direct messages here are really uh, blowing up. So I want to make sure that we can get as many as we can. And I see that uh, our time is uh, is moving. So if you're on if you're unsure about, for example, covering your hair, how do you approach that in dating? Since a lot of time men want to know if you are 100% going to do it or cover your hair. So. If you're unsure if you're going to cover your hair, you probably don't want to date someone unless you're ready to cover your hair that is of that religious level, right? What, what you're talking about is a particular religious level uh, of, of orthodoxy that those people want after marriage that the woman should cover their hair. And if you're not ready to do that, then uh, don't date someone. That would be disingenuous. But if you're like, I don't know, and it doesn't really matter to me. And if that's what he wants, then I'll go with it then you can date them. But don't be disingenuous. That's what I would say. Um, next question. Jews of color and the dating scene. What are your suggestions? Is there a city or state where there's more options? I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've set up a lot of Jews of color and I don't think it's an issue. Not, you know, I, I think that, I don't, I, I don't know because I'm not a Jew of color. So I don't want to speak to a, a an issue that I don't know. But I could say that from speaking to and spending time with various Jews of color, sometimes we think that there's a bigger issue than there really is. I'm not saying that 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 it's not difficult. And I'm not saying that there aren't there, there aren't times where people will not date someone of color. But sometimes it's more in our head than it is in real life and and like anything else you have to be vulnerable and and put yourself out there 
Um, okay. Thank you very much for all your kind, kind words. I really, I'm looking at the the comments now, and and I really, I really, it's really touching to me uh, that you that, that all these wonderful, kind uh, words as I'm speaking that that you that you're putting in the in the, in the message box, um, in the chat here. Next question: Thoughts around building true conviction about someone if all is going very well, but no prior relationships to compare to. My own answer to myself is just time, letting things continue so that it becomes obvious in one way or another. I think that's a great answer. And, and sometimes I, I love that you you added your own answer to yourself because sometimes that's really the best answer. I started off by saying, and I really, really hold by this, dating is the most difficult thing in the world to do. There's nothing more difficult. Being vulnerable getting the rejection. I, I see it every single day and it's very hard. It's very, very hard, but there's a great, great value. There's a great payout. And that is finding that person. And every single rejection is one step closer to finding that person. And I really, really believe that you're going to be able to find your person. I really do. Don't give up. Don't give up. There's somebody out there that is just as much looking for you as you are for them. I wanted to know if you think there's any merit in moving cities for the sake of better dating, a loan versus a job. What criteria would you consider for a move? How do you know if you should relocate or stay and keep trying to date in your current location? So it's a really good question. Should you move, right? For some people who are not in the tri-state area and they want to be, or New York, right? That seems to be the place where some people want to move because they think there's more people. I don't think more options equals a better chance of finding your person. You only need one. Today, you can move virtually instead of physically. You can date long distance. I don't know. There is an idea within Judaism, Mishana Maka, Mishana Mazel, that which translates as if you change your place, you change your, your mazal, your luck or your, your the con mazal really means the constellations or the stars are aligned differently for you. I, I'm not going to say from my experience that it's the best thing to do just to date and move just because for no other reason than you think that there's a better chance. Maybe, or maybe you can try doing it for a week, go on a long vacation in that place that you want to move to and just go to, all the events you can in that place and see if God has it in store for you and the stars are aligned for you during that time. But to just pick up and move, I'm, I'm not 100%. Uh, let me think about that a little more. Next question. Can you address the difference between dating after widowhood versus divorce or never married? Um, I had my person and lost him. And it feels like it's more impossible for a second chance at love, especially as a young widow. First of all, I'm I'm very sorry. And my condolences. It's very hard to have your love and to lose that person. I don't know if I can give you a general answer. This is maybe something a little more specific. But I will say that nothing will be the same as you had it. And that's part of the mourning that you have to go through. It'll be different. And you may not, you, sometimes we look for the same, but we're never going to find the same. Or we compare to the person who passed, but that person has passed. And it's, it's very hard to compare. And it's not fair to the person that you're dating to compare. I do think that there's a chance. Now, what's interesting is that you you differentiated between widowhood, divorce, and never married. And there there is... Um, a lot of differences there, though they're more specific, those differences. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna address them right here, right now. But I do think that 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 that's a very, very important question. And I think that it's an important exploratory uh way of of uh, really exploring and looking deeper as to the kind of person that you're looking for. It could be that based on your question, 
and I don't know the difference and the, the details of your question, but based on your question, it could be that you're not ready to date yet. And that's okay. Sometimes we're not ready to date. And it's okay. You can say, I'm not ready yet, but I will be ready soon. And you can ask, what do I need to know to be ready? How do I know I'm going to be ready? That's an interesting question. But sometimes we're not ready yet, and, and it's okay. You don't have to be dating all the time. Uh, next question. When should you meet if you are set up with someone in another country? I think that there's no rule to it, but you should not be dating via uh, video or phone for too long. How long is too long? Every person is different. I don't want to give a, a, a number of how long is too long, but not long. Don't let it go on for months where you don't see each other. Don't let it go on for weeks sometimes. I, I don't know if I have a, a clear answer. Uh, next question. Thank you so much for this invaluable class. You're very welcome. I'm very happy to be here. It's really special to be here tonight and to be with you. Um, I'm a, I'm a 55 year old young woman who has been divorced men for many years. I have two very healthy, communicative, loving relationships that have both lasted over two years. We both, with both, we never fought. We had common upbringings, felt safe to be my authentic self. My friends and family liked both of them and supported the idea of the two of us together. Fantastic. Each of our children and parents thought we were great together. We loved being with each other and each other's families. I never wanted to put pressure on the man, but after two years, I asked him, where do you see this going? And by the way, before getting serious, I asked them both, do you want marriage? A long-term relationship, and both said yes. I asked again on the second date to confirm, not to waste time, my time or the time, um, as this is what I want. When that question came up, in the short, the answer is you are looking to the future and I am the present. I just said, I just said it, I run after it. This is what I do, I convince I am the one, why? Wow, okay, I'm gonna try to see if I can answer this question the best I can. So um, just because somebody is marriage minded doesn't necessarily mean that with, that they're going to actually pop the question. Some people are scared. They're just scared of popping the question. So you have two options there. If you are dating someone, let's say you're a woman, in this case, you're a woman who's dating a man. And you feel like, no, no, come on, where's the ring already? You have two options. Option one is you wait until he's ready. Or option two is you propose. Oh, well, this is a world of equality. Why can't you propose? Well, just buy a watch and get down on one knee and say, will you marry me? Now, if you want, you can make it really special and put some flowers all around. I don't know. But if this is really a world of equality, why can't women propose? I, I've Look, I just had this, just had the situation. The woman was, everything was perfect. And she said, he's just not asking the question. And when she... When she spoke about that, she's really the one who kind of is the is the one who kind of is the 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 moving the relationship along, and he's just saying yes to everything. I said, okay, you're the one that needs to propose. He's not going to propose to you. I said, go propose to him, and she did, and he said yes, and they're getting married. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. So that's my first thing. The other question that you have to the fact that you're running after something and you're convincing that this is the one and you're, you, how do you attract without convincing? This is an issue that I see quite often. And the issue is where your heart and your mind are not meeting. Now I can do a whole class just on this. I can do a class on a lot of these questions, but I can do a whole class just on this. So your heart feels you're attracted to one thing, but your mind knows that that's not good. And I think it's really important. And there are really good exercises that, that we can go through. And maybe at some point we should do this to be able to make sure that you're attracted to the same thing that your mind knows that you need. And that is probably why 
you are running after perhaps in your words, the wrong thing. Um, this person says, I feel like it's challenging to find my soulmate at age 44. I've definitely tried my best going out of my comfort zone. Keep on trying. There's somebody out there for you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep on trying. Hashem doesn't create fuzzy math. If there's a God in the world, there's no fuzzy math. There's somebody there. And there's somebody looking for you. And you just got to keep on trying. And when the time is right, it will be right. Just keep on trying. And every time it's the wrong person, you're one step closer to the right person. Please don't give up. 44 is not an age to give up. In my opinion, 94 is not an age to give up. Oh, I got to tell you this story. This is a fantastic story. So I, I'm, I, this, this woman calls my office and I happened to be there and, and they asked me if I, if I can take the phone. And so I, I took the phone and, and uh, she says, hello, is this Rabbi Barnett? Yes. Are you the matchmaker? Yes, yes. I'm 92 years old. I want to get married. Now, if 92-year-old tells you they want to get married, you got to listen to this. This is too good. So I said, sure, okay. And what are you looking for? You know, at my age, you can't ask for too much. I said, okay. So what do you want to ask for? And she says it straight up to me. She says, I think the main thing I want is I want a guy who can drive at night. And to that I say, 44 is not too old. The 92-year-old wants a guy who can drive at night. So go find your person. And you know what? Maybe that's all you need, a guy who can drive at night. I'm just saying, maybe 92 and 44 are the same. Maybe not. I don't know. I had to tell you that story. Sorry, it was too good. Um. Okay. One of these... Because there's a bunch of questions here I don't understand. I'm going to have to come back to that. Um, is it possible that I didn't recognize my soulmate and he came along? Interesting that you're asking that question. So I'll ask it I'll ask it again. Is it possible that my soulmate came along and I didn't recognize him? According to John and Julie Gottman, who, in my opinion, are the relationship experts, the gurus, they study relationships in Seattle, the Love Lab. I'm sure some of you have read their books. If you haven't, I encourage you to read their books. They say that at the age of 35, you probably would have dated four people you could have married. So yes, according to this research, I say yes. You probably, and that's why I think mystery in your history is so important. Go through your past. There could be somebody you've dated that you should reopen that relationship. I'm encouraging you to think about that. There could be somebody in your past that you've dated and it wasn't the right time. If you want to know what right timing is, you could have dated them and it wasn't the right time. And now is the right time. And open it up. Don't be scared. Go back there. There could be somebody there for you. Next question. I'm relatively new in the, in the country and my friends are limited to my coworkers for now. How should I go about meeting people? Should I just tell my coworkers? Yes. Tell your coworkers. Tell everybody. And go online. There's lots of ways of going online. Whichever country you're in, wherever you are, there are options online. And a lot of people are finding are finding ways of, 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 of meeting people online. Whether it's through the apps, whether it's through Matchmaker, it's all good. Next question. Rabbi, I'm not very religious, but I've been told to go to a synagogue to try to find someone. Is that permissible? Even though I'd be going to potentially find a date not for religious purposes? Absolutely. Absolutely. If I mean, it could be. It's not a bad idea. I mean, people have met people in synagogues. There's a lot of other ways of meeting people. But yes, absolutely. And and you know what? It's not a bad idea for a Jew to go to synagogue. Why not? I mean, I am a rabbi after all. I should probably promote that. Okay. Um. Is there a suggested amount of time to date if marriage is your purpose for dating? Mm, depends on depends on which religious orientation and where you are. And that's just too much. 
there, there's too much nuance there. But that's a good question. I just need a lot more specifics, like where you are if for a specific religious level or uh, age range. Um, when is when is the proper time to ask someone what they're looking for in marriage? I'm divorced. When is the proper time to ask someone what they're looking for in marriage? If you're mar if you're marriage minded and you are dating for marriage, right away. I know it's scary sometimes because it means that you have to be a little vulnerable, but I would say right away, that's a, probably a really good idea. If you want to get into a long-term relationship, then right away, maybe not the first date, maybe first, second date, third date. First dates are awkward and there's no way to unawkwardize a first date. That's the reality. It's going to be awkward no matter what you do. So maybe the second date, because then it won't be as awkward even though it's still a little awkward. Next question. How much consideration should we give in, of different levels of, of observance? I'm willing to start keeping kosher, but I grew up in the Soviet Union without religion. So to me, Judaism is more cultural. And while very important, I often pass talking to girls who are very who are more religious. Good question. Um, I would say that religious is a value so if you're open to that value and you know what that means, then even if you're not currently uh, keeping kosher and observing Shabbat and you want someone, let's say, modern Orthodox who uh, keeps kosher and observes Shabbat, then do it. Or, but what I would say is start doing it now. Don't do it for marriage. Do it now and then you'll become that person who's Shomer Shabbat and, and keeps kosher and then you can attract somebody who's similar. I'm gonna say something a little controversial. This is my anecdotal research. From my anecdotal research, I would say the following. It's okay for the woman to be more religious than the man. It's more complicated for the man to be more religious than the woman. This is my anecdotal research. It's not across the board, but I can tell you that from my setting up that if I, if I set up a, a woman that's more religious with a man that's less religious, there's a better chance that everything will be okay. The opposite way around, it's very complicated. I had a couple that was in my office last week and he decided, they're married, and he decided that he wants to be more religious. And he was upset that his wife doesn't want to make the kitchen kosher. And here I am, the rabbi. I said, Rabbi, tell my wife that I should make the that she should make the kitchen kosher. And I turned to him and I said, how often do you cook? So, well, never. So, so, sorry. It's not your jurisdiction. You can't decide if the kitchen's kosher because it's not your kitchen because you don't cook. If you cook, you can decide if you're kosher. The end. Um... All the people who are asking me if I can find a good fellow for them, please. If you don't have a a uh, profile and Match on, on jmatchmaking.com, that is the only place that I do setups, and I'm setting up lots of dates. Probably many of you have been set up on a date by me, and so I set up a lot of dates. If I have someone for you, go on jmatchmaking. I will set you up with them, and that's the best way. Um, okay, next question. How do I get out of the friend zone? Oh, the friend zone. How do you get out of the friend zone? Ah, that's a rough one. Um, don't befriend people of the opposite sex. Is that too straight up? Should I be nicer about it? I think that if you're looking for something romantic, don't try to friend everybody and then find find it to be romantic. Go for the romantic. It, it, it's not true. It could happen, but it's not true that friends leads to romance. It could happen, but often not true. How do you balance being proactive in dating with letting God take the reins? I love this question. 
and guide you to your soulmate? Do you believe that you can mess with fate by manufacturing the dating process too much with apps and matchmakers? Fantastic. So I will start off with a critical Jewish value. Jews do not believe in fate. We believe in destiny. The difference between the Greek version of fate is that fate means that there's nothing you can do to change what's fated out for you. We don't believe in that. We believe that you make choices and every day you try to make the best choice you can make and destiny will be the result of your choices. So there is no way that you're doing too much. And there's no way that you will mess up with fate by manufacturing a dating process too much. You got to do your thing. God will take care. Don't worry. God's a big God. God will take care of the rest. But you got to continue doing your thing. Don't give up. Try everything. Keep on trying over and over. Don't give up. There's somebody out there. It's the hardest job in the world. I can't say it enough. There is somebody out there for you. Going back, um, I'm wondering if you have suggestions for working with matchmakers on some of the sites when they say the options are limited and that there aren't good fits out there for you or when the matches are off target and not meeting basic requirements. So what I would say is you have two options with matchmakers. There's lots of different types of matchmakers. That's number one. If you're on, let's say, a site like uh, whatever, any of the matchmaking sites that are out there, you have a couple of options. When a when a when a match is off target, then you can just be clear of clarify that this you know this is what I'm looking for, or maybe you want you just want them to send you as match. Maybe you're the kind of person that just wants to be able to go through matches. If you want more quality matches, then be specific. Say I want more quality, and this is the criteria. Specific is terrific. So if a matchmaker knows something specific to know you by they're going to probably be more accurate in your matches. Making finding my partner a priority with a job and children and a solo mother makes a very difficult endeavor. I agree with you. So try to do the best you can. No one's asking you for any more than the best you can. Okay. Next question. Thank you for hosting this event. You're so welcome. My question is, how important is location in the dating process? If one is located in a central location like New York, should one feel compelled to relocate to a major city in hopes of engaging a larger dating pool? So I did approach this before, but maybe I'll go a little more deep dive on it because maybe there's there's more that we can learn from it. Location is very important. It plays a, a, an, a, a critical role in the dating process. So, yeah, places where there's larger populations, there's going to be more numbers, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. So you have to decide what you want, quality or quantity. Larger, larger cities will offer a broader pool of potential partners, which means you'll have more opportunities for meeting people. If you're the kind of person who is looking for something specific, probably more opportunities to meet people is going to be very beneficial for you because you have very specific criteria and you want to find that and you probably won't find that in a smaller community but smaller communities provide something else the pool may be smaller but they're tighter knit which means you can have more meaningful connections and you can have more introductions in those communities so don't disregard the smaller communities it's a big mistake to disregard them something else i want you to think about as well is that it's essential to think about the type of life that you envision for yourself. If you value the hustle and bustle, if you value lots of events, being out every single night, if you value the diversity of a big city, then moving to a place like New York could be very beneficial for even reasons beyond dating. But if you appreciate the quieter pace, community involvement, uh, proximity to nature, I don't think that moving solely for dating is gonna yield happiness in the long run. I think you should really think about yourself first and then think about the potential for the future. 
something else that maybe you want to consider that in smaller communities, um, there may be an easier time to find uh, networks of Jews. You, again, less people, but you only need one. You only need one. I can't say it enough. And then, of course, online dating is very important. Don't just move somewhere. Visit the place. Spend some time there. Check out the dating scene before you decide to move there. Um, okay, next question. Um, I'm, I'm a convert. I'm 33 years old and single. I received propositions, but I noticed that a lot of religious guys, single guys older than 30 are not so serious or have commitment issues. I just want to stop there. And, and, and I think it's important Though I want to value your question, I also want to just focus on that nuance of your question. A lot, many, got commitment issues, it doesn't matter. You're just looking for one. The, this idea that, and I see this so much around singles, that, and, I, and I'm generalizing here, which I shouldn't be generalizing, but if you're having this kind of thing about people in general, it's not... It's not people. It's just the one person you're looking for. That's it. The person asking the question continues. I really want to meet someone single without children, but I'm wondering if I should be open to divorcees as well. Is it better a good guy who is divorced than someone single because of some issues? If you're asking the question, then I think that the answer is yes. Often, the answer to your question is in the question. It's a great question. And if you're asking it, it means you thought about it. And if you thought about it, it's probably a good idea. Because there's a lot of other things you can think about and a lot of other people who, who, um, who, who would think about that or not think about that. Being previously married doesn't necessarily reflect negatively on someone. Life is complex and relationships are even more complex. So a divorcee may have gained a significant amount of self-awareness, a significant amount of growth and maturity from their past relationships. It's not a bad thing. And if you do consider dating a divorcee, it's essential, I would say, to understand the reasons behind their previous marriages end. That is a point of judgment, but just to gauge the compatibility and maybe even the potential challenges. They've done it before, so they may know a lot more about how they could be as a spouse than someone who's never been married. So sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's even better. Um, I would also say be open. Don't be desperate. It's beneficial to be open-minded. It's a good idea. Don't feel pressure to settle because of uh, age, because of uh, external pressures. It's about finding someone who compliments you. It's about finding that person. So, I, you know, sometimes we, we worry about a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's just about finding the right person. And, and, and as hard as that is, I just want to, again, it, it's the hardest job in the world, dating. I really feel for you. I really do. Next question. This question has been in my mind for quite some time. As someone who was raised in what would most consider an ultra-Orthodox Jewish environment, there is some sensitivity inside me to the laws of Shomer Nagia. That being said, at this juncture in my life, I find it somewhat difficult to cultivate deep connectivity to a romantic partner without being able to touch them. It's not about the touch, but rather about the ability to cultivate connectivity in what feels right. Thank you for any insight. So what I'm going to say to you, the, the questioner, is a great question, 
is that there are a lot of, um, you probably have heard of this before, the five love languages by Gary Chapman. There, there are five ways that people want to be loved. And you can look at them. I'm not going to go through all of them now. But one of those five is physical touch. So my assumption, I'm going to guess that your love language, your primary love language is physical touch. And that's going to be really hard for you. You're probably a very touchy-feely person. You're an emotional person. And because of that, um, that's that's going to be really hard. Now, there are, other, there are other ways of creating deep connection without touch, even if that is your love language. The funny thing is, is that it's exactly the reason why Shoma Nagia works for those who who follow it, it's because touch is so powerful. It's so special. It's so holy. It's how we connect, especially for someone whose love language is physical touch. And we don't want to create those connections except with the special person, the, the, the right person, the one that we choose to be our person. And if we create that connection before we know and we commit, we risk staying in the relationship because we feel connected, not because it's really the right thing. Very often, people confuse love and lust. Physical touch can create lust, and you think it's love. And so it could be, and again, it's not for everyone. Some people don't follow this. But for someone who does follow this, it, it may be exactly the right reason for them. Now, the physical touch, it could amplify emotional closeness, but it's not the only way. There are profound, profound values in the Shomer Nagia in not touching. There are emotional connections that are created that are beyond physical touch. And it could be that because you're such a touchy-feely person that you need to create that bond, that emotional connection with the person that touch is going to confuse you. Okay, next question. Are some people just meant to be alone or not married? Wow. Are some people meant to be alone, not married? Okay, let me see what I can do here. I think that this really delves into the intricacies of human destiny, of individual purpose, of societal norms. The, the concept of being alone or unmarried, I think it touches on a spiritual level and on a psychological level. So, you know, within Judaism, in traditional Jewish thought, marriage is the most important thing that a person could do in their adult life. It, it, right in the beginning of the Torah, right in Bereshit, it says it's not good for man to be alone. It doesn't mean that everyone is destined to marry. It just means that loneliness is not a good thing. Today, post-pandemic, we see that, that there's another pandemic, the pandemic of, of loneliness. Now, societies over history have often placed a significant emphasis on marriage as a, as a rite of passage or as a hallmark of adulthood. Yet not everyone finds a partner and not everyone feels a desire or, or the need to marry. So I think it's important to differentiate between the societal expectations and your individual path. You might have... Uh, for whatever reason, or uh, a life mission that doesn't align with marriage. It, it, you might find fulfillment in other ways. It's career, spiritual pursuits, uh, uh, community involvement. I know it's, it's, it's a good idea, and it's the right thing to do from a Jewish perspective. But for some people, it's just not practical for whatever reason. It could be that because you don't know what a marriage looks like because you don't have role models for marriage. And so therefore, you just don't know what it looks like. Now, I, want, I do want to differentiate between being alone versus feeling lonely. It is crucial 
for you to have that internal dialogue and distinguish between being alone and feeling lonely. Being alone is a physical or a social state and being lonely is an emotional state. You can be alone without feeling lonely and you can be lonely without feeling alone, without being alone. You can be in a, at a big event and feel lonely. So for some people, lonely being, being alone is profound and it's a fulfilling experience for those introverts in the room. And for some people, they, they can't be alone, not even for a moment. So I just think you should have that internal conversation with, with yourself. If you want, if you want to find someone, there is someone out there for you. If you don't want to find someone, there's no one out there for you. It's your life. And don't do it because, oh, your parents or somebody else wants or society wants it. You have to do it because you want it. And if you don't know why you want it, then discover, look into it. There is, we live at a, an amazing time where we have access to information like never before in history. And because of that, you can find anything, anything you want to find. And so if you don't know why, ask the question and discover. Ask people. Ask Google. Next question. What advice would you give to someone who feels the people they are interested in and complement their personality, their family and community doesn't approve of or is jealous of, whereas those who are difficult matches, personality, value-wise, and the other person's interests have people seem to approve and be happy with? Oh, what a great question. Please, please do me a favor and get into a relationship with someone you want. I know that your parents aren't going to be happy with me, but they're not here in the room with me here now. Don't listen to them. Listen to yourself. Do what's good for you. It's your life. Nobody can make choices for you. They can either choose to support the choices you make or not support the choices you make. But make the choice for yourself, especially the choice of finding a life partner. That is your choice to make and your choice only and your choice alone. There are people that can support you. There are people that cannot support you. You should rather be around the people who support you. But it's your choice. To make sure you're well-informed and make sure that you have an emotional and intellectual feeling and they're in sync. But most importantly, make the choice yourself. And thank you for asking that question. Okay. Next question. In my current situation, I see two sides of the dating state of affairs. An abundance of widowed and divorced people from which to choose and the scarcity of the right people to initiate a serious relationship. What kind of advice do you provide regarding the situation and how can we navigate under this duality? Well, good question, but I would say the duality is in your head because you're just trying to find one. I'm not going to disregard that navigating the complexities of dating, especially when you have lots of options or you have scarcity, you need to know what you're looking for. You need to know who you are. You have to date yourself first. You need a patient approach. So again, and I've said this before, quality over quantity. You're just trying to find one. Communication. Vulnerability, dating takes vulnerability. When you're dating, especially in the early stages, open communication about expectations. Open communication about values. Open communication about relationship goals. It's going to make it so much easier. And please, on your list, you can have physical attraction, but don't make it number one. Make it number two or three. Look beyond the surface. Initial attraction, common interests, they're essential. 
but they're not number one. They're there. They need to be there, but not number one. Find the person's values. Find their approach to conflict. Find their long-term goals. You'd be surprised. They may grow on you. Don't just say no right away. There's a lot more to life than that. Also, I would say that sometimes our idea of the right person can be based on past experiences we're comparing or maybe on family or societal expectations. So maybe you should reconsider some of the criteria that you think is essential and be open to dating someone outside your typical type. I often hear from people who are engaged was not anything I was looking for. It happens. It happens. Okay. Uh, please, if you have a question, just write it in here, and I'm happy to to uh, happy to answer it. Question here. I'm wondering what suggestions you have in terms of determining an appropriate age range to date. Um, my opinion is not more than ten years. Oh, sorry, not my my opinion. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who don't know this, but um, the reality is I will not set up anyone more than 10 years apart. There are matchmakers who disagree with me on this, and they're welcome to disagree with me on this. That's my opinion. Um, my question is for the rabbi. Is ever right to assume that you want to be on your own? Yeah. And it could be that you want to be on your own right now. That's okay. It could be that you just want to be on your own right now, this week, this month, this year. Life is fluid. Life is not black and white. It's not just one dimensional. It's multi-dimensional. And it could be that you don't want to date right now. If you don't want to date now, it's okay. Take this time for yourself. Look within, spend time, grow. And I think it's such an important, important part of this. So often we're just, it's not the right time. It's just not the right time. And that's okay too. Thank you for all the love messages that people are sending me. Really appreciate it. it makes me feel so good. Really, really appreciate it. Um, so I, I, I wish all of you good. Now, I can't believe it. It's already uh, an hour and a half into our conversation. I will take um, one or two more questions, but then we will uh, we'll end it for the night and we will do this again. Don't worry, we will do this again soon. I see how important it is and I, I would love to, uh, to, to be there for you. And it's an honor to host it, an honor to be here. And if there's maybe one or two last questions that anybody has, you're welcome to, uh, to ask it. If you um, are talking to someone and it's a great conversation, please take their information now so that you don't get stuck where I turn this off and uh, you're not online anymore. Take, make the move. Um, okay, this question, what is the most timely advice that I can give you today? Um, the most timely advice. Number one, there's someone out there for you. Don't give up, look. Try everything you can. Make it a priority. Find someone. If you're not ready to date, don't date. There is someone for everyone. There is someone for everyone. Your time will come. Just savlanut, be patient. Everyone has their challenges. You ask, why does God make it hard for someone? I don't know. I'm not God. But I guarantee you, that I've got a lot of questions for God, and that's one of them. A lot of questions. And you know what? I'm not sure I want that question answered right now. So I think you should always know that there's someone there. And there are people out there who care. And Hashem should 
bless each and every one of you that you should just by the fact that you're here and the fact that you care enough to listen and that you spent the past hour and a half in this space, in this room, and we've been here together, just that fact alone, that you care enough to be here and you're listening and you're open to new ideas, Hashem should give you through this beautiful time of year, which we just passed to Ba'av, that you should be able to find your person and your person should be able to find you. And I hope, I hope that you tell me and you share with me and I can't wait to be able to hear the good news that you found your person. Have a good evening, everyone.